Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Claire Morton, and I am the Community Assistance Manager here at MHP. Welcome to our first timers, and welcome back to those who have been with us before. Um, this is MHP's web series, More Than Compliance, Multifamily Districts That Work in Your Community. We are at session nine of 10, graciously sponsored by the BART Foundation. This series serves as an important part of MHP's technical assistance program for MBTA communities. In previous sessions, we learned about the benefits complete streets and neighborhoods brings to communities, water and wastewater basics, encouraging family-friendly housing in MBTA districts. We also provided guidance on action plans and technical assistance available to uh, MBTA communities. We explored housing at different densities, and we discussed making the case for affordable housing, local engagement, and narrative change. Today, we'll do a site plan review. There you go. Today, speaker is um, Judy Barrett of the planning, the Barrett Planning Group, and attorney Amy Kless of KP Law. Judy Barrett is the founding principal and managing director of Barrett Planning Group, LLC. She brings 33 years of planning and community development experience as a consultant and community and economic development professional with state and local government. Judy has devoted her career to building the capacity of cities and towns to solve difficult public policy questions and to develop effective leadership and advocacy skills. She has prepared and managed a variety of projects for public and private clients, including comprehensive and strategic plans, zoning revisions, housing studies, and more. She is well known for her work in affordable and fair housing policy and inclusionary zoning. Attorney Emma, Amy, excuse me, has 16 years of experience in land use, regulatory, energy, and environmental law, including wetlands, coastal permitting, dredging projects, and Chapter 91 licensing, and Chapter 40B. She has represented municipalities, regional regulatory commissions, and private parties in proceedings before the land court, superior court, administrative bodies, and housing appeals committee. Amy has also represented clients before federal courts, including the Environmental Appeals Board. Before joining her firm, she was a partner at a Boston law firm where she practiced land use law, energy law, environmental law, real estate, and associated like lit litigation, excuse me. With that, I will pass it on to Judy. So thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping you can all uh, hear me. Uh, Amy and I have put together a, a set of slides, uh, which I'm sure you were all expecting. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the slide deck. Um, and I think what I'd like to suggest maybe is let us kind of go through these slides. And um, if you have questions, uh, I guess put them in the chat. Is that what you prefer, Claire? Is people hold the questions until we're done or do you have a preference? Um, you are driving this vote. It is entirely up to you. We can go ahead and save it, you know, put your questions in the chat and we can respond to them later in the Q&A. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and go through the slides and then people um, don't, you don't have to wait until the end to, to your question, put it in the chat. We'll get to the questions, um, but it might be a little easier, I think, on us if we can just go through the points that we have. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start to share my screen. And can everybody see that? A nodding head would be a big help. Super, thank you. All right, so uh, this is off-site plan review. Um, the point of which is uh, understanding how to use this great tool to do permitting for as of right development. Um, and I, I was kind of happy when MHP contacted me about working on this particular webinar because I, I find just in the zoning work I do and a lot of work with cities and towns that this is one of the um, least well-used tools uh, in the toolkit. And it's just such an advantageous 
uh, process to be able to work with um, when you when you know how to work with it. So we're going to go through kind of what site plan review is and what its purposes are, why it's so important um, and to have as a tool that is ready to go for the MBTA communities districts, but frankly, I would say for any type of permitting as of right development, where the authority comes from um, to do site plan review, how it works, uh, isn't it a lot like a special permit? The answer is no, but maybe a little bit yes. <laughs> and then what should a site plan uh, review bylaw include? And I, I, I say that not recognizing that many of you uh, in this webinar probably have a site plan bylaw and may not have to re may not have to write one but you may want to think about whether it needs any updating where you're going to have to put it to a fairly rigorous test for the MBTA communities review process so I'm going to start these slides and we're going to get to kind of a review of the case law on it which I'm going to turn over to Amy and I think we will then sort of play tag team uh, going through the rest of the slides but Site plan review simply is a, it's a development review process um, that exists in your zoning bylaw or ordinance. Um, it gives you an opportunity to look at projects that uh, are ultimately going to get a building permit, but to get a chance to speak with the applicant and work with the applicant on the layout of the project, um, its appearance, uh, design review is certainly an eligible component of site plan review but certainly health and safety impacts and understanding ways in which those can be best handled um, and environmental impact as well. So these are, that's sort of the scope, the typical scope of a site plan review process. Uh, things that tend to come up in site plan review uh, are around parking, traffic and circulation. Lord knows parking just seems to be everybody's obsession, but it is an important, uh, a dominant uh, conversation piece in many site plan review processes, at least that I've been involved with. Drainage and roadway construction, signage and lighting, utilities and screening and so forth. And then, as I mentioned, design review uh, in communities that choose to include that as part of their site plan review process. Um, one of the things I love about site plan review is that, at least in Massachusetts, it occupies this wonderful realm of home rule. Um, it is not in the Zoning Act, Chapter 40A. Um, you will find a reference to site plan review uh, or site plan approval in the Chapter 40R um, legislation, but it's not in Chapter 40A, the Zoning Act. Nevertheless, it has been upheld um, by the courts as a method of reasonable regulation of a as of right use. It is not a special permit. It is not a discretionary process to deny a permitted use. And I think that's just a very important thing to kind of get your heads wrapped around that is kind of one of the critical differences between site plan review and a special permit is that this is not about the discretionary ability to say no, it's how to say yes and get the best project you can for your community. Um, Bob Mitchell, I have to quote here, Bob, um, whenever Bob and I work on zoning diagnostics or zoning reviews for communities, one of the first things that one of us looks at is the site plan review bylaw because very often it sort of is mixed in somehow in a very awkward way with the special permit process and it really should be uncoupled from it. Um, and so in the APA mass guidebook, which is one of the resources I'm gonna talk about before we finish this webinar, um, Bob wrote about the site plan review. I think he wrote the whole chapter and kind of explained that it really is a creature of local government. It's something you can have um, and you should have. You can use it to protect public health, safety, and welfare. That really is the overarching point. There is a lot of flexibility to determine how you do site plan review, what the timeline is, who's going to make the decisions and so forth. But all of that kind of needs to be in the local ordinance or bylaw so that everybody understands the rules of the game. It's typically used to review large or more complicated projects um, than what typically goes directly to the building inspector. Uh, typically new construction of commercial, industrial, mixed use or multifamily developments, often institutional or so-called exempt uses are covered. Um, the ability to regulate those is more confined by chapter 40A, but, but nonetheless, um, these are, this is for the types of projects that you can review. Um, if you have existing development, commercial or industrial, and a pro project wants to expand a certain beyond a certain percentage, often that comes under site plan review as well. 
Uh, one of the beauties of this process is that it allows the permitting authority to um, have a process in which all the various town departments that would typically get involved in reviewing plans have a way to sort of communicate uh, and get all their feedback up into the place where the decision is ultimately going to be uh, made. And many communities uh, have a, a pretty good uh, staff team review process that happens before a special permit or site plan review where all the departments are kind of comparing notes and putting together a consolidated review, which uh, I'm sure you can understand is very helpful to the board that's going to have to make the decision. Um, it's a way to sort of share information internally and also with the applicant. Uh, again, it's not used to deny um, a use. Uh, so a few caveats to keep in mind, um, especially with this new law that, that uh, communities are all thinking about how, how, can, I, how can I comply with, uh, with Section 3A and, and at the same time, you know, get a project that's going to fit in my community somehow. I think it's a good idea to think about site plan review as an opportunity to work with applicants um, rather than, than not work with them. Uh, to focus on getting the best project you can for your community, uh, which I admit is the same advice I often give boards of appeal when I'm working with them on comprehensive permits, but for to focus on how you get this to be the best that it can be and have a process that's sort of efficient and clear and consistent with the goals of Section 3A, which of course is to get multifamily housing built uh, in places where uh, it, it, it is not available or where it should exist. Um, based on your own local planning and the uh, requirements of the statute. Don't go into it assuming you can deny a project because the public opposes it. Um, think about imposing conditions or don't just, don't rather impose conditions on a project that would be tantamount to denial. Um, the point is to get a good project uh, and then be careful about asking for submission requirements that go beyond the purposes or legal basis of site plan review. I think when you think about your application process, you need to sort of get to the other end of it, which is someone has to make a decision. So what's the information they need to make that decision? And how do you keep sort of extraneous things out that may create sort of a distraction in the permitting process, but really can't influence it anyway? So I think with this, I'm gonna to turn to the, some of the cases and Amy's gonna talk about those. Hi everyone. Um, so most of the cases that, um, that deal with site plan review, or almost every case that deals with site plan review, um, specifically states that site plan review is not discretionary, it is not a special permit. So um, the um, SJC in the, um, the YD dugout case, which was probably the first case regarding site plan, um, said that it's a regulation of a use rather than it's prohibition. Um, and it has to do with reasonable terms and conditions. And honestly, it, nothing has changed really since that, um, since that case, that premise is still alive, that it's the regulation of an allowed use and you are allowed to condition it. However, those conditions have to be reasonable. Um, the next, um, I don't think I have, you, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so the, um, the next case was um, the Skit case, which um, clearly puts out a distinction um, between site plan review and special permits. The, um, in the Skit case, the Braintree tried to make um, all of the uses um, essentially required a discretionary permit for all uses in a certain district. Um, it was really a special permit, but they called it site plan review. Um, and the court said, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a distinction between special permits and site plan review. Special permits are discretionary, site plan review is not. Um, in, the, um, in the Prudential case, the court, um, the court actually evaluated the judicial um, review of a site plan review and basically said that um, the, the standard judicial review for a site plan, which is, was the, deci was the decision, um, you know, sufficient to warrant, or was the, um, was the evidence sufficient to warrant the decision? Um, that's not, that's not in play when a judge is reviewing a site plan review. 
because the use is as of right. So again, it goes to um, it goes to what Judy had said earlier that you cannot deny site plan review. Um, it you know site plan review again has to do with um, the regulation of permitted uses, not their prohibition. Um, so the next slide, um, where um, a local board um, it need not be held um, to a demand as a demanding standard as site plan as special permit or a variant standard. So the Bowen the Bowen case um, had to that dealt with um, comments from other departments. Um, and so for example, if the um, if your site plan review bylaw states that all site plan review applications must be distributed to the following departments for comment. If, if you get a comment back from say um, Department of Public Works that says that you know this shouldn't be built. Um, that still does not allow you to deny um, site plan review. So, you know, you don't have that, um, you don't have that demanding standard that you could have, for example, with a sub with a subdivision if the Board of Health does not approve it. Um, that's right. You, you can't implement that into a site plan review bylaw. Um, the, the next case is the the Osberg case, which again says that um, site plan review has to has has been found to be a permissible regulatory tool uh, has to do with aesthetics environmental impacts of land use the other thing that the Osberg case um, that the Osberg case uh, determined which which I found very helpful is that unless your bylaw specifically requires a supermajority or your site plan review is attached to a special permit then it's only a majority vote if you're if your by in this case, uh, the Sturbridge bylaw was silent, um, and so therefore it was only a majority review, only a majority vote was necessary. And again, that outlines a distinction between special permit and um, site plan review. Again, special permit in the, in the statute, in under 40A, it requires a supermajority, but site plan review is not, it's not an animal, uh, you know, it's not a 40A animal, and so therefore um, if it's silent, if your bylaw is silent as to the vote, it's a majority vote. Um, and then the next one with, um, this is a land court case that talked about um, the freeze protection under 40A section six. Um, there is no freeze protection. Um, they're not triggered by a site plan approval decision. Uh, 40A section six specifically states building permit or special permit. Um, and so you really can't insert site plan review into that again where the court is making a distinction between special permit and site plan review they're not the same thing um and then uh, the last um the last slide is that um in the board of alderman um of newton um this this case discussed a constructive approval where this was a it was first supermarket it was a um site plan, special permit, they were connected. Um, the court ultimately held that constructive approval did not occur. Um, however, they never really addressed whether constructive approval could occur um, when and site plan is not a, is not directly linked to a special permit. It's a very interesting, well, I think it was a very interesting case. Um, you know, so again, you want to make sure that your, um, you know, make sure that your site plan review um, bylaw specifically addresses conditions which you know constructive approval could occur um, and just to try and you know outline it to make sure that it's clear to applicants and to the board this is going to happen if you do not um, act on this within a certain time um, and again um, in the Cumberland farm case that was that was um, I mean a pretty big case <laughs> I sound like a like I need to get a life, but um, and that that's the case that determined um, whether site plan is appealed by cert by certiorari or by or under 40A section 17. And in that case, the the court came out and said that a um, site plan review, even though it is um, triggered by sometimes tr triggered by the um, issuance of a building permit, um, it is still 40A section 17 appeal. And that's it for me, I think. Thank you so much. That was great.
Um, I think sometimes we probably both need to get a light, Amy, but it's fun. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the site plan review process. Um, and there are probably some slides in here, Amy, where I might bump mm -hmm. up these to you as well. Yep. So, because uh, you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'm sure, uh, mm -hmm. in your career. So, you know, who gets to decide a site plan? Well, because again, this is a creature of home rule and not Chapter 40A. Uh, you kind of get to decide. Uh, I've seen it all over the lot. It usually is the planning board, um, but there are towns where the select board is deciding site plans, uh, sometimes for commercial projects. Um, uh, there are some towns that have a site plan review committee. Uh, in order to, you know, have a party where there's a, a number of different town officials get involved, but usually the planning board, um, and usually there are other groups that pr pr that uh, perform kind of an advisory role, kind of like with a special permit where you have reviewing parties. Uh, it's not uncommon that site plan review will operate in a similar vein. Um, that could include town staff. You may want to get comments from other boards and commissions, although as Amy noted, um, those other boards and commissions with their separate jurisdiction are the ones who deal with their jurisdictional issues. It's not something that site plan review uh, necessarily can touch, uh, but it's good to have the information. Um, you also can handle site plan review administratively. I happen to love this. I wish more towns did it. Um, by having professional staff uh, handle some of the site plan review responsibilities of uh, very small projects or projects that are unlikely to have a significant impact. There's really no reason why uh, that even needs to go to a planning board. Um, we have a few communities in Massachusetts where it is almost entirely staff done. Um, and it, it helps to sort of eliminate some of the drama, frankly, that goes on. But, but my experience is that for the most part, it's planning boards that tend to handle site plan review. Judy, there's also um, some bylaws that have um, site plan review will be done by the Zoning Board of Appeals if a variance is involved in the project. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Which, which also um, kind of speeds things up for, for development. Yep, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, so how is it being used by the permitting authority? It's to understand the impact of the project, um, kind of find out if there's any sort of issues with zoning or whatever uh, that the project might be triggering um, and determine really if there are any conditions of approval that need to be passed along to perhaps the building inspector. So if the planning board's conducting site plan review and they're going to issue an approval, but they think that there are some conditions that need to be attached to that, that often um, is sort of how the site plan review process is used to kind of understand what those reasonable conditions uh, might be. Uh, it's not used to determine if something is an allowed use, uh, as we've said, and we'll probably continue to say, driving all of you nuts, I'm sure, is it's not for discretionary decisions. Uh, it's not to impose requirements outside of zoning, as Amy just mentioned. And it's not really for imposing kind of unreasonable conditions that really go beyond, um, you know, what an applicant can, quote, reasonably be expected to do or reasonably expect to be expected to do for a use that is a permitted use. So what do you get in a site plan application? Um, again, I'm sure a lot of you on this uh, uh, webinar have seen these before, but just to be clear, there is a plan, so site plan approval, um, typically on D size sheets. Um, there, are, you know, letter, there are 11 tabloid size sheets that are available for distribution. Um, these site plans can be expensive to produce folks if they're on, all on D size. Typically, um, and it ought to be both prepared and stamped by a registered professional engineer. If it's an engineer preparing the plan, if there's an um, architectural set, then the architect uh, would be preparing it. Uh, there are often landscape architects involved, and there's sometimes a land surveyor as well. So anybody who is involved with the preparation um, ought to be identified on the plan and also uh, with their registration and stamp. Um, there are typically, especially for larger projects, some submissions that accompany the plan set, such as a traffic study uh, or drainage calculations to sort of understand, again, the impact of the project. Um, things that the application ought to answer. So what, what's the site and what are the boundaries of it? Um, what's on the property now? Uh, is it vacant? Is it already developed? Are there buildings? Are there roadways? Are there roadways? Are there wetlands? You know, what is the site? 
are there easements that currently exist uh, on the site? What's around it? Uh, and what are the surrounding streets? If you're trying to understand the potential impact of the project, you sort of want to know both what it is, what the site is and then what's around it. Um, where are the closest intersections and what's currently on abutting land? Uh, if there is a need for a traffic study for a larger project, you, you typically are going to want to know where the nearby intersections are. Uh, what's the shape of the land? Is it flat? Is it sloped? Uh, what does the applicant want to build and where will those buildings be located? Uh, what district are we in? And what are the minimum dimensional requirements uh, in the district? So if I'm looking at this plan, I know what the district requirements are. I ought to be able to see uh, that, the, that the, what's proposed on the plan conforms. How much parking is required? Where's the parking going to be? How is traffic going to move in and out of the site? Uh, if we have um, you know, pedestrian walkways, which I'm sure we will, there's some kind of pedestrian accommodation. How are we separating pedestrian and vehicular traffic so that for the sake of safety, um, are there, is there bicycle parking? I hear this more and more. Um, and if you're going to require that, it's probably a good idea to make sure that you have something in your zoning bylaw to, to cue the applicant that that's going to be a requirement. Um, what are the utilities on the site? Uh, and what are the proposed utilities? So there's already water or sewer there, you know, a, que a logical question might be to make sure that, um, you know, the, uh, that the, there's the adequate water to serve the site. Um, where does the applicant plan to put signs and what's the outdoor lighting going to be like? Um, if you've got lighting for cars or parking lots and lighting for pedestrians, um, I assume you're probably gonna be looking for different types of fixtures and lighting so that people clearly can see the separation between vehicles and people. Uh, and what will the buildings uh, look like? Excuse me, that did not need to happen. Um, those are kinds of the questions that, that the planning process or site plan process should identify and disclose so that the board understands uh, kind of what they're looking at. Amy, did you want to add anything before I go on to the next piece of this? Um, no, not really. I do think one of the most um, the helpful things to know is what what's there now mm -hmm. and what's going to be there. That that's so always get the existing conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll move on. So since it's not enabled through state law, there's no specific submission requirements, um, and all of that has to be determined locally. And I find that this varies a lot from town to town. Um, there are some pretty nice site plan bylaws out there that you might wanna take a look at if you're thinking about updating your existing site plan bylaw or, uh, or you haven't got one and you need to write one. Um, then there are just some out there and Amy, you may have ideas to even add to this, but ones that I've looked at that seem particularly well done are Amherst um, Barnstables. Barnstables, by the way, is very much a staff review process. Um, Amherst is, has been in place for a, quite a while and works very well. Northampton has a great site plan review process. Um, Lexington's looks great as well. So, and I think Lexington's may have been updated with a zoning update that occurred sometime in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, I'm not sure about that, but I believe that's the case. Um, you know, don't be afraid to ask for legal guidance from your town council and just be mindful of the past legal decisions uh, and challenges to site plan review that are out there when you decide kind of what you're, how you're going to design your site plan process. Um, since it exists in zoning, um, this is, again, because there's no sort of state law or legal framework to fall back on. You know, the bylaw is in the zoning. I mean, ordinance or bylaw. That, that's sort of where the authority is. It's what the procedures are going to be. But the regulations that, um, that sort of get into the details really should be administratively adopted by the site plan approval authority. Um, for example, you don't need to put in your zoning bylaw that 10 copies of the site plan application are required. That can be in the regulations of the planning board. The site plan bylaw does need to tell the applicant where to go to find that information, such as the planning board's rules and regulations for site plan review, but just kind of separate out what really is sort of administrative um, and, and what needs to be in the bylaw. If you sort of think about it, 
do you really want to have to go back to town meeting to change 10 copies of a plan set to eight? Uh, that's the sort of thing that can be handled administratively. So the bylaw should lay out the permitting timeline and sort of all the kind of legal steps that are involved. Regulation should explain what the applicant needs to submit in order to file a complete application or for that matter, a modified application, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, Amy, you wanna take this one? Sure, so, um, so this is what happens when, uh, when a, um, an application comes in. Um, and you know the board goes through the review. So under Prudential, in that case, um, there's only three ways that you can act on um, on a site plan application. You can deny it if the required information is not provided, um, and you can um, approve it with reasonable conditions if needed. You can deny it if no reasonable conditions can satisfy the problems of the plan. That's different. Mm -hmm. than denying it, denying the use. So I, I just want, I do want to make sure that that, um, that that is clear. So if you are going to deny it because the reasonable conditions can't satisfy, you know, problems of the plan, for example, internal circulation, um, if your bylaw states that say, site plan review regulates internal circulation and your plan has a major problem with that, that, you know, the fire department can't get their largest truck around the parking lot or to two or three sides of the building, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if that's the case, you are not denying it. You're not denying that use. You're denying the problem with the plan and there, you can't condition it. Um, you can't, you know, there's just no way to re, you know, revise the parking lot or anything like that to take out an island or anything. Um, and so that, that's, you know, and when you do deny it for that reason, you have to clearly state your findings. You have to have findings and your findings have to state here is why it's being denied. And, you know, and the fact that nothing can be done to fix this problem. Um, it, it's, it's difficult. It, it's, a, it's a difficult decision to draft. It's a, it's a high bar to be sure. Yes, very high bar. So, you know, ostensibly written decisions are, are not actually required, but it's a darn good idea. And really it's mandatory if you're going to impose conditions of approval, you've gotta be able to lay out for the building inspector to understand, for the applicant to understand, um, you know, what, what the conditions are that have to be met. Um, if you're going to have a simple majority vote, which is typically what these are, um, you know, make sure that the vote is clear and on record uh, with the with the board's decision. Yeah, always do a decision, please. Yeah, I know it really is. It's like, <laughs> I can say it's not required, but you really ought to have a decision. It's like just basic, but um, you know, you can direct in your site plan process where an appeal goes. Uh, as Amy said, under um, 48 Section 17, which is the appeal process that's provided for in the Zoning Act. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, and I, you should all look at your site plan bylaws carefully and see what they say about appeal. Um, but in the, in the old days, we would often find site plan bylaws that would say, well, if the planning board, so the applicant's unhappy with the planning board's decision on site plan, they can appeal to the board of appeals. And um, it's not pretty. And so if you really do not want to pit boards against each other, so direct your appeals to um, the land court of superior court under section 17 of 40A and just keep the CBA out of it, uh, assuming the planning board is the, uh, the permitting authority. Um, you know, courts will generally defer to a site plan authority if there's an approval with conditions, uh, if those conditions are reasonable. Um, if a site plan for use is allowed as a right is denied, the court's gonna give it very close scrutiny uh, for all the reasons that uh, Amy has covered. Um, they are a bit apples and oranges, the special permit and site plan, and, and yet in some ways there's, there's similarity. Um, with the special permit, as I think most of you know, there is quite a bit of discretion on the part of the special permit granting authority, whether to approve uh, a project at all or to approve it with conditions. Um, there's no direct entitlement to a special permit and you're not compelled to grant it. Uh, of course, you always have to be careful that you're not denying something 
on some on some whim. But site plan review, by contrast, there is really extremely limited discretion about uh, this imp imposing of conditions, and the approval is is essentially guaranteed. Again, unless, as Amy said, there's just no way for the project because of the site or the design or something that that the the public health and safety uh, it, adverse impacts of the project just can't be fixed. Um, so this is just sort of another way of thinking about relationships between special permits and site plan review. Special permit uh, is actually a creature of the Zoning Act and is largely regulated there as a result. Um, the granting authority for a, a special permit is set in the statute, planning board, ZBA, or board of selectmen. Again, I'm just speaking from a town perspective right now, but um, site plan review is really at the discretion of the community. Most towns, it's the planning board, but not always. Uh, and as Amy said, if there's a variance involved, it's a good idea to have the ZBA handle the whole thing. But, uh, procedures and a butter notification is set by statute uh, for site plan approval. It's at the discretion of the municipality, uh, whether you uh, want to have a butter notifications or a public hearing notice or simply handle it administratively at a public meeting. Uh, special permit requires a two thirds majority. Simple majority is adequate for site plan review. Uh, the decision has to be record, recorded with the Registry of Deeds, um, but for site plan review, it's not required, although many communities do require it. Um, and appeals for special permits are set in the statute. For site plan review, there's more than one option, but take it from a woman who's been through this a lot, <laughs> years of experience, um, send them to court and don't send them to the Board of Appeals. That's my opinion. Amy, I don't know if you disagree, but- No, I 100% agree. Yeah. So keep the processes separate. Um, yeah. You know, your, your bylaw really ought to have, or ordinance, a section on special permits and how all that works, and then a separate section on site plan review, uncouple them. So the site plan review process for permitted uses is clearly distinct um, from the special permit and kind of just make the line clear between what goes through special permit and what goes through site plan review. And there's really easy ways to do that. Um, in your table of uses, for example, you can have a column that sort of indicates whether something requires site plan review. Um, if it's a special permit, it's gonna be denoted there anyway. Uh, sometimes in the text of the bylaw, there will be a list of specific kinds of activities that require site plan review. Uh, the best advice I can offer is make it simple, make it clear, um, so everybody understands. So if you need to write a site plan bylaw for the first time, uh, or if you're trying to update what you have, um, we have some thoughts about to share with you on that. Uh, and one is just being clear about when's it going to be required. What's the type of use or the scale of use or the characteristics of the project or the location? What's going to trigger someone having to go for site plan review. Who's going to make the decision? Um, as I said earlier, it's usually the planning board, but it can be some combination. Um, some communities have a site plan process where smaller projects are handled by the staff, larger ones go to the planning board or whoever the, the board is um, for, for larger projects. Um, and in, on rare occasion, you'll find that all site plan review is handled at a staff level. Uh, I will point out that outside Massachusetts, it's actually quite common <laughs> for site plan review not to be um, something that becomes a, a public process um, because the uses are allowed. It's assumed that they're going to be approved. Um, and then, so, as I said, administratively, but uh, it's often not, it, I'm seeing this more and more that communities have sort of a minor site plan process, which is determined by, typically by the size of the project or the type or both, that goes to staff, things that are larger go to uh, the board with approval authority. Um, ask for help from your town staff um, or your, you know, the other boards and commissions that may have a review role, but uh, the staff are very accustomed to reviewing these plans. They kind of know what to look for. They can provide very helpful comments um, and they're, they know how to stay in their lane. And that's really what you need for the board that has to make a decision, especially if it's a project that's controversial, is how do you stay in your lane? What actually is your jurisdiction? 
um, what, what is it that you can actually control? If your site plan bylaw has uh, a design component to it and your town has a design review board or committee, uh, it's certainly a good idea to involve the design review board as a reviewing party. Uh, they may have their own separate process, uh, which I'm not you know, really prepared to get into in this webinar, but they may already have a process uh, in place. But if they're going to be also advisory to a board that has site plan review authority that has a that, that includes design, the design review board uh, really ought to be involved. Um, you know, lay the procedures out, like who, who, who where, where do I submit my plan? Um, how is receipt of that plan verified? And when does the clock start ticking so-called? How can I find out what you need from me? I'm now speaking as the applicant, right? So how do I find out what, what you need from me so I can submit a complete uh, application? And if you refer me to the planning board's rules and regulations, where do I find them? Uh, what's the time frame for a public comment process? Uh, what's deliberation look like? I guess the question I have as an applicant is when am I going to get a yes? So I need to kind of understand how that whole process works. Is there public notice at all? Um, and what does it look like? Uh, is there a process for extensions? Um, the board may need to extend the 30 or 60 day comment. I'm just making this up as I go along here, but let's say your site plan process is intended to run out a clock of 30 to 45 days. Um, and the applicant needs an extension or the board does, is it clear that, that that's a possibility? And how does that happen? What's the timeline for making a decision? What's the vote required, the quantum of vote? Uh, how do I appeal? And then if I need to come back to you to change my site plan, because I discovered that something uh, on the site was a little bit different than what I expected to encounter, uh, or the market's changed or something's changed, how do I come back and modify without perhaps having to resubmit? as though it's a brand new application. Um, existing conditions plan is absolutely paramount. You know, you're gonna think about what do you need for plans? What's the layout of the project? Uh, what are you doing around uh, erosion control? Where are the utilities gonna be? How are they coming into the site? How are they connecting to the proposed buildings? I want a drainage plan. I want to understand, or grading plan. I want to understand how you're handling drainage. What's the site circulation gonna look like and what's, what is the interaction between the site and the street? What is this project going to look like and how, how are people supposed to find their way around? Um, you know, I've seen site plan bylaws that have some of this stuff in it, but I'm just going to re reiterate, don't ask for things that the board can't use because once you start asking for things in, a, in an application process, that the board really cannot use to regulate the, the project, you're, you're creating a situation where you could have a, a very distracted conversation taking place that, that, has, that isn't even, ever gonna be able to find a home in the site plan decision. So you know things like fiscal impact studies or tenant selection plan and so forth, the board can't do anything with those other than acknowledge receipt and potentially get involved in a heavy discussion in the middle of a public hearing or a public meeting about something that's not gonna be able to take, that, that they can't take into account when they write their decision uh, anyway. So just word to the wise, think about what does the board need in order to make a decision. Um, administrative site plan review may not require any kind of formal public notice. Full site plan review with the board may not require a public notice, like an advertised notice in the paper, but, but has to be on the board's agenda. Um, typically, I do see at least some kind of public notice requirement for these, but again, it's up to the town. Um, the board's review really should provide for a shorter review and decision timeline than a special permit, but it's up to you. Um, if you want to parallel the special permit, uh, 65 and 90 days, uh, you know, that's really up to the town. But again, because the use is a permitted use, you sort of have to ask, well, why do I need as much time as perhaps a discretionary process would need? Um, and just be thinking about how do I connect the process I'm going to have for site plan review with the scope of the review, the purposes of the review, and the allowable outcomes of a site plan review process. Um, there's a lot of benefits to having this kind of process, even though um, you might want to have 
more jurisdiction than you will actually have, but being able to have a discussion with an applicant um, around a project that's most likely gonna be approved, uh, how to get it perhaps to be even better for the community. Um, municipality gets to share information or suggest some perhaps changes in design that might make a better project. Um, you don't wanna build in enough time for these conversations to take place. Uh, without necessarily elongating that process to a point that's unreasonable. So many of you are probably familiar with Chapter 44, Section 53G, which provides for um, the collection of fees from a developer for peer review. It doesn't explicitly address site plan review, um, but there's broad language in 53G around sort of, you know, any bylaw or ordinance um, of a regulatory nature. So our position is that you can require, if you need assistance to review a plan, you could charge reasonable review fees um, and retain consulting help to review the app components of the application that are within the board's jurisdiction. Site civil review, if the applicant has submitted a traffic study and you want an independent review. Um, sometimes lighting is a huge issue in communities, um, maybe uh, you know, someone who can advise on lighting or something or, or even design review if it's a big project, you know, one of the things I have found in the work I do on, on chapter 40B is that a lot of the issues with density are really around design. And so if you can sort of focus the conversation about design, um, you can often get a much nicer project and the applicant still gets, you know, what they want to build. So just think about what do you actually need and don't ask for what you don't need, but if you do need some assistance, um, you know, you, you should be able to require the applicant to provide uh, assistance and you wanna address this in your site plan bylaw and regulations um, to make it clear that the board uh, can assess, uh, can, can retain consultants and require the applicant to pay for them uh, under 4453G in which case your regulations also should just say how you plan to hire consultants. Uh, and you probably have already got all this anyway in special permit um, regulations that you have. So, you know, just think about, you wanna make sure you provide for that on site plan review because site plan review is, spe is separate from the special permit. Amy, do you wanna add anything to that that I didn't already say? No, just that um, if you do have a bylaw that has a, um, a shorter time period for review, you want to make sure that you're able to build in peer review because yes, you know if you only give yourself 30 days that's that's quite tight to get um, a peer review done and have the applicant address it and come back so um, you just want to keep a track of your timelines right so constructive approval um amy mentioned this earlier actually do you want to talk about this or this one amy since sure well constructive approval is when um is when uh, obviously i think everyone here knows that when a board fails to act within a certain time um so for example if a board fails to act on a variance um, within 100 days and file the decision within 14 days thereafter um there could be constructive approval constructive approval goes back to what the applicant applied for um so Again, we have uh, the one case where there was constructive approval contemplated on um, a site plan special permit where they were connected. Um, and the court went through the whole constructive approval, ended up finding out, finding by facts, finding that there was no constructive approval, um, but they didn't really address um, site plan, you know, constructive approval for, um, for site plan. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to, um, it needs to be specifically stated in the bylaw that if the board fails to act within a certain time, uh, the applicant, you know, the application will be approved. We'll, 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 you could just will be constructively approved or approved by default. Um, it's it's good that um, you know it, it's a it's a good tool to keep boards moving. Yeah. Um, you know, so you don't have this constant, you know, extent, you know, continuances and asking for extraneous information, things like that. Um, and also it's, it's good to, you know, to keep everybody's toes to the fire. Um, so, um, if there is no, if, it, if your bylaw is silent on constructive approval, again, we don't have any cases that directly, um, guide us on that. So, um, it's just another, 
it's just another issue with vagueness. So we do want to avoid that. So I, I do suggest that um, constructive approval language be inserted into bylaws for site plan review. And also the other thing too, is that with, um, with um, variances and special permits, um, you can also extend the timeline to act. You can extend the time to act. Any extension to um, any extension of a time to act um, needs to be in writing and should be filed um, should be filed with the town clerk if the site plan application is filed with the town clerk. If the site plan application pursuant to the bylaw is only filed with, say, the planning board, then the written extension should be kept with the planning board. Thank you. So we're almost at the end here, and I know I can see that there's questions that we're going to have fun with, but I um, didn't want to end this without pointing out that beyond this slide deck, there are some resources that I think may be very helpful to some communities. Uh, first of all, uh, and this, of course, is in addition always to talk to your town council if you're going to re you know, revise your zoning in any way or have any questions about site plan review, is just make sure that you have a conversation with your own municipal attorney. But in addition to that, um, any of you who are members of APA probably know that APA Mass has published a guidebook to Massachusetts land use. Um, it is available to APA Mass members through, um, through the APA Mass website, which I put, put here. Um, and Bob Mitchell and Bob Ritchie did the work on that. And there's a whole section in that handbook on site plan review, and it's really well done. So you might wanna just take a look at that as well. Uh, APA uh, National has the uh, planner advisory service system that many of you are familiar with and the Quick Notes uh, sequence series of, of PAS. There's a, a whole um, document on site plan review that's also very helpful. And finally, for your boards, especially Citizen Planner Training Collaborative has a training on site plan review, which this particular slide deck we've just gone through is partially modeled upon. So um, that's just a really great training, extra, uh, training uh, program that may be helpful to your communities, especially uh, if you're accustomed to treating site plan review kind of like a special permit process, you're probably gonna wanna make sure your boards have had that training uh, as they venture into the world of, of approving uh, projects under Section 3A of Chapter 40A. So I think with that, Claire, I should probably just go ahead and stop screen share and we'll try to take questions. Is that okay? Yep, that's perfect. Go right ahead. Okay. So do you want us to go through the chat or do you want to do them, Claire? How do you care either way? You can do them. Yeah, you can do them, Julie. Okay. Um, can reports such as traffic studies and stormwater calculations be required with the site plan? Amy. See, I'm reading yes. the question, so I might just say to you, you want to answer this? Um, yes, they can, in my opinion. Yeah. Not um, for every, you know, again, not for every single site plan review, but if you're reviewing, you know, a 300,000 square foot building with parking, et cetera, et cetera, sure. Um, can a zoning bylaw provide that site plan review that's not related to a special permit require a super majority vote? Um, under, under the home rule, yes, I think it could. Yeah, they could. Most of them don't, but they, can, they could. It's again, because it's a creature of home rule. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are decisions that the locality can make. Um, and so you just want to think about, well, what do you need for a bylaw that's going to be effective for you? to work with and um, one that you can administer. I think those are just the really important things to consider. Um, another comment, I thought appeal of a site plan review that's not related to a special permit is complicated and involves applying for a building permit, having that denied, appealing the denial rather than 40A section 17. But Amy seems right. to say section 17 is, you know, is, is right or is always. And, I know the answer to this, but I'm deferring to you. So, so you all, I guess what I was trying to say is that um, you always end up with um, section 17, 40A section 17. So if your bylaw does not state that there is a direct appeal pursuant to 40A section 17, then you are correct. You have, it is, it is complicated. You have to um, apply for a building permit, get that denied, 
you know, or an abutter applies, you know, a, or a, that would be the route for an abutter to take two. You have to you have to appeal a building permit. It goes to the ZBA, and then you ultimately any appeal of the ZBA's decision is 40A section 17. Right. And that's why um, Judy and I both encourage bylaws to specifically state the appeal is pursuant to um, 40A directly to directly to court. Right. Okay, another question. To Brian Keating's point, that was a previous question, Amy. For the purposes oh. of the proposals that will result from MBTA community zoning, can we discuss characteristics or impacts of pro project size? Example, the traffic report accompanying a site plan indicates that there will be severe impacts on critical intersections. The proposed project is so large that it will, quote, use up existing utility, water, or sewer capacity effectively eliminating the possibility of development for other permissible uses in the area or throughout the town. And the applicant's not amenable to reducing the size of the project. So I think the question is, if they're gonna have this kind of impact on nearby intersections, the applicant's not willing to make changes in the project or they're gonna chew up all our water supply and the applicant's not willing to reduce the scale, can we turn them down? No, not through site plan. That's what I think too. Particularly since the, you know, under 3A, the use, you know, is, is mandated. I, I know this may not be what everybody wants to hear, but the intent of the law is to get housing built. And I think that what you need to think about is how do you create a permitting process that's going to get you an ability to consult and speak with an applicant to get the best project you can for your town. And if you adopt that perspective, you're more likely going to have success with this than, um, than a system that just has a lot of people frustrated and frankly, a lot of legal bills. But um, that's just my perspective on this. I'll, I'll get to hands raised in a minute. I'm going through the, the chat questions first. Um, can site plan review be done without notice to a butter's publication of notice and, and hearing? Yes. Oh, they're, they're often done that way. Mm -hmm. um, for voting purposes, whether a majority refers to a majority of current, currently present voting members, it still has a quorum, or majority of all seated positions, even if not are all filled, it's up to the municipality, correct? In other words, a quorum of those present versus a quorum of all seats. It has to state that right. it would be it would it would have to state that it's a majority of all seated positions or all all positions. Um, but if it's silent, it's just um, it's just a majority of those in attendance. Yeah, assuming they where, have the, where there's a quorum. Yeah. Um, this presentation seems geared for admin, admin staff. The volunteer planning board is described as drama and to be avoided wherever possible. Is, is it me or am I right? No, it's not just entirely geared to staff, although staff typically are the ones who work on writing a site plan bylaw. Um, and I think that that's something to bear in mind is if there are ways to uh, recognizing what the intent of the law is, if there are ways to design a permitting process that doesn't, um, you know, always have to involve a formal public meeting. I mean, the, and I'll just give you an example. Um, if a project comes in that in an MBTA communities district, um, that it's the 15 unit and acre density, but is a very small project, does it need to go to the planning board? And that's a decision you guys have to make. But there may be ways to think about the use of administrative review. It's totally up to the community. I think also that what we were saying was um, if there is, if the appeal of site plan goes, if it doesn't directly state that it's 40A17 and it goes to the ZBA, you then have two boards, um, two boards at odds mm -hmm. potentially. And that, and you want to avoid that, that is what you want to avoid. I think that's where we mentioned drama. Yeah. Can the site plan review process for multifamily housing complying with section 3A be compared with the process for ZBA approval 
of a comprehensive permit under Chapter 40B. I'm going to leave this one to you. So, so that's a, that's a really difficult question because um, so if we go back to the infrastructure question, for example. And if there is no, and say that the town, the municipality feels that there's not enough water. Under a 40A analysis, um, that can be a reason for denial provided that a, um, provided that a market rate subdivision had been denied because of lack of water. So under 40B, the, you know, the, the standard is, are you treating the affordable development the same as you would treat a, um, a, a, you know, a market rate development, where here um, we don't have that. Um, we don't necessarily have any anything to go on. Um, and so I, I think that, yes, I think that we are um, somewhat, it, it, the review will somewhat be analogous to 40B because it is an as of right use. Um, I can't. I can't say that 40B is an as of right use because, well, it's not. Obviously, um, they're you know they're allowed to put a 40B anywhere. Um, the multifamily housing, you will have um, your bylaw will have parameters for that. Um, they'll you know you can have um, you know as long as you meet the density that the um, that the Commonwealth requires of you, you know you will have parking parameters, things like that. So. Um, I don't want to say it's exactly the same. The only thing I will say is it will be hard to deny. And I'm sorry, that was a real lawyerly answer, but gotcha. I just don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to take a couple of the hands raised and then go back to chat. Um, so Val, Matsard, your question's next in chat and I'll get to you. But uh, I think Eric had your hand up and then Tim. I, I think that was the order. So I'll take Eric first and then Tim. Tim was first. Was he first? Are you you honest soul? So Tim, you get to speak. I'm eating lunch. Eric can go to, go first. <laughs> All right, no problem. Thanks. Um, so I appreciate the answers about the infrastructure questions. Um, you know, my response to that is that number one, I kind of understand the utility one, but um, and you say no, you wouldn't the board wouldn't be able to deny based on uh, utility capacity being exhausted. Um, however, with regards to, let's just say, a traffic intersection that causes um, unsafe conditions, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how you just have to throw up your hands and say, well, we'll just have to wait for some traffic deaths in order to, um, you know, mitigate or install a, a traffic signal that the developer wasn't willing to pay for. I mean, I, I think that, first of all, I, I, I think that you would be hard pressed to require a developer of a multifamily development um, under 3A to, um, to, to be responsible for offsite infrastructure concerns. You know, and again, I, I, I was very cognizant of not comparing um, 3A to 40B. Yeah. And I know Judy was too, because they are completely different, but under 40B, you're not allowed to require offsite infrastructure um, improvements. And so um, I would, and again, you know, 3A is brand new. We have no case law. We have no guidance from the courts. I would assume that the courts would probably um, look to 40B and say, yeah, the infrastructure is, is the problem of the municipality, unfortunately. Um, and again, particularly since 3A is mandated by statute. Yeah, I mean, I respectfully disagree only because I feel like there are municipalities that are probably on the call or at least subject to the legislation that don't have, or you can't even compare them with regards to the traffic infrastructure between like Malden and some other smaller community, um, but they're still required to have development at the same density. So you're going to inevitably come up with a municipality uh, with where if you proposed exactly the same project and they were both compliant with the 3A legislation, one's going to be very easy to accommodate in one municipality and the other one's going to cause, like I just said, you know, extreme traffic safety issues and never mind the infrastructure components. But the second part of my question with regards to addressing the um, like sewer capacity, which somebody else had, had brought up, if the response of the state or advisors that are helping to develop the guidelines about 
you know, a project using up remaining sewer capacity is, well, you can accept um, package treatment plants. Why can't a municipality require or at least stipulate that they'll accept um, applications that include package, tre package treatment plants in order to maintain capacity within a, uh, you know, sewer infrastructure? to facilitate or, or maintain the potential for development of other uses besides multifamily. I think that's that's like part of the uh, anxiety that municipalities have about the legislation is that we change our zoning to comply, uh, a project gets proposed and you know basically eats up all the existing capacity in the infrastructure and there's there's no way for the municipality to try to maintain future development potential. So I, I would be um, I would be interested to find any kind of any legislation that thought through every single problem because sure. clearly there's there's not I mean um, and it's also my opinion that a lot of the legislation puts all of the problems back on the on the municipalities to figure out um, and I, I think you bring up a very very good point um, you know with regard to um, with regard to sewer capacity if the capacity is there I'm not sure you can say no I'm not sure you can say that, oh, this is gonna be it for us. One we of the can't... suggestions that um, Katie Lacey had brought up was asking if there was a predetermined process in place for the allocation of infrastructure capacity. Is that a sort of like relief valve that could potentially be implemented um, in, a, in uh, I guess, with MBTA zoning amendments? In other words, if they're passing amendments for uh, zoning for compliance with 3A, can they include, uh, infrastructure capacity allocation, I guess, calculations that help a municipality feel like they would be maintaining some of the capacity that I, I mentioned. That so might, that would that, be something that perhaps DHCD would consider putting into their into their guidelines and their regulations. That'd be great. That's probably beyond what we can address. Yeah. Here. And I'll put one more positive comment out there. If, if anything, it's fantastic to have so many municipalities talking about the site plan review process. Um, so thank you for having this topic today. Okay. Tim. Thanks, Judy. Um, so I, I, I suspect I, I know the answer to, to my question, but it's always good to have Judy and, and a highly credentialed land use attorney um, confirm it for me. Um, so the site plan review being a kind of a creature of statute, a creature of local control, you know, there's a lot of case law and, and, and Amy kind of went through a, a good amount of it, kind of establishing the parameters. Um, but is there anything in, so I, I guess I'll phrase the question of, is there anything out there in case law that provides general kind of guidance or requirements for site plan review a la 40A and special permits for local zoning. I'll, I'll give you the, the example I'll use is, you know, there's a case that says that, you know, site plan review is a legitimate uh, method for uh, regulating aesthetics. Um, but if your bylaw doesn't actually refer to aesthetics or design review or specific building materials, for instance, um, are you out of luck, basically? Um, so, you know, does it, does, is it that the case law allows you to craft your site plan bylaw in a certain way, but you've got to explicitly do that, or you can kind of depend on, you know, case law backing you up if you kind of make a decision? Um, you should always, it, it, you should try and have design um, parameters within your, within your bylaw, um, or at least, at the very least, allow your, um, allow your bylaw to um, enact regulations regarding design elements. Um, there, there um, I, I did try a case, or I, I did have a case where um, the design review elements of a, of a zoning bylaw were challenged. They were challenged as being vague, um, and you know, cause it said New England, I think it said something about New England, um, you know, design, et cetera. Um, it was upheld in the land court that the, that the um, bylaw was adequate. Um, you know, so it's always better to have it in your bylaw, I guess this would be my answer. Yeah, I mean, your bylaw might say as part of the review criteria, uh, you know, think about design. Um, and then in the, um, you know, the bylaw can also provide for uh, the planning board to have, a, you know, adopt design guidelines for 3A districts um, as on file in the planning department. So people at least know where to find what it is that the board wants. 
Yeah, mine doesn't. So um, this may be something. We'll That's why I'm bringing this up, Tim, because yeah. I think, you know, if you if you want people to respond to submit a plan that responds to your requirements, you got to tell them what you want. And if you don't tell them what you want. You can probably end up finding yourself in the appeals court where the judge ultimately says, yeah, your bylaw is fine, but, but why do you have to go through all that when you could just tell people what you want? I've read more zoning that says what communities don't want and very little that says what they do want. And it's just remarkable to me. Um, let's go back to, I don't see any other hands raised right now. So I'm gonna go back to the chat. Um, how do we deal with the lack of understanding as to whether there is adequate public water or sewer? Will this be provided in the model site plan review information? Our water commission is unable to express its capacity constraints to the planning board. So this may be a, a more of a DHCD guidelines question, mm -hmm. I think, that yeah. something we can address. Um, I don't know if anybody is on today from DHCD or if MHP staff can respond to this question, or maybe we just bump it to Chris and ask her uh, to think about it, um, Chris Clutchman at DHCD, but I don't, th I don't think we can answer this one. Mm -mm. We'll put the email in the chat um, where all these sorts of questions could be directed oh, okay. to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Does requirement for peer review costs have to be in the bylaw or is it enough to provide for it in the regulations? The regulations, yep, because it's this, it's statutory. Are court decisions regarding site plan review of uses per 40A allowed by right, such as educational uses relevant to section 3A? Uh, I see. So the yeah, question is, the courts, the courts have, have opined on the ability to use site plan review to review churches and schools and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, is any of that relevant to the 3A review or is it really separate? In other words, I guess is, is this exemption if you want to call it that. So, so I guess the only difference would be that this that three A is not an exemption. Right. So three A allow three A requires zoning um, to to allow for a certain density. So this means that you can't put a multifamily development in an area that's not zoned for it. Whereas you know under you know under um, educational uses you can put a school wherever you want. Um, so so it's different. So uh, I would I would say I would you know I would say that no those really wouldn't be because if your multifamily development requires site plan review it requires site plan review which most I most bylaws do require site plan review for multifamily developments. Has EBA approves a change of use between one previous non-conforming use. Eric, you have the best questions. Um, between one non, one previous non-conforming use to a new non-conforming use using an existing bylaw that provides that discretion. Is it now treated as a by right project and only subject to site plan review? Um, so are we talking about a non-conforming use only? Or is it the non-conforming lot? What is the, is it non-conforming use? I think you should maybe should explain this a little bit more. Sure, you've got you've got a, a parcel that has a an existing non-conforming use for its zoning district, and it seems like a lot of municipalities have a uh, section of their bylaw that provides discretion to the ZBA to evaluate applications for change of use to another non-conforming use, um, and when that takes place, um, we've had that happen in Tingsboro. For our purposes, it did trigger a site plan review for the new non-conforming use, um, but I was kind of looking for, I guess, specific feedback or advice from you that stipulates what your opinion is. Does that make it a now a permissible use that is subject or cannot be subject to site plan review? I, I would assume that it's probably fine that it's subject to, to site plan review. It, it doesn't make it a per, it does not make it a permissible use if. If the ZBA determines that it's there's a there's one non-conforming use and there's going to be a change in that non-conforming use and if they go through the powers test and they decide that yes this change can be made it's still a non-conforming use okay. um, and so the difference would be if you have a non-conforming use 
and you change that non-conforming use to multifamily, which is a conforming use, you would be subject to site plan. It's different. I think I get it. So it's different. Eric Sears mentions there's a site plan review training session on Monday, December 5th, uh, for anybody who's interested. Full confession, I happen to be doing that training. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so uh, Danielle in Medford has a question. Can't the dimensional standards in the ordinance control density as long as it meets the 3A required minimum? Um, so standards such as height, ground coverage, et cetera, there's no reason to try to deny a site plan review because it's quote too big. I agree. So yes, you can, you know, as long as you're meeting the state minimum density requirements, you can have other requirements. It's in, it's, it's part of your zoning bylaw now. So. I think that is all the questions. I don't believe I, oh, there's an, oh, there's one here about CBTC registration. That's your training that you have coming up on the, on the, Fifth, I think it was that um, someone mentioned. I think I'm doing that one. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. It's terrible. Any you other are. questions? Um, I think we might be done. Claire, I think I get to turn it back over to you. I bet you do. Go ahead and share my one last time. Um, so thank you so much to both Judy and Amy for your time today. You're thank welcome. you to our audience for your insightful questions and comments. Um, so we usually have been meeting for the last nine consecutive Wednesdays, but we're going to take a break next week and we will resume in two weeks on November 30th uh, for our final session of the series, including affordability in your MBTA districts. Um, if you can register, we'll put that in the chat. It is not the same registration link as the previous one. So please be sure to register if this session is of interest to you. Um, we will drop it in the chat along with a lot of um, helpful online resources. With that, uh, we will see you all in two weeks. And thank you, as always, for your time. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.